Today we are in part 7 of a sermon series we have called Damaged But Not Destroyed. And today I want to ask this question. This is the title, What Can God Do With Damage? Because some of you have been broken and have been through things and you are like, can God really use me? Can God really bless me and still favor me in spite of what I've been through? I remember when God just called me to ministry. And my, my response to God was, no, I'm not going into ministry. Here's my reason. I'm too damaged. I said, God, I am too damaged to do your work. I'm too damaged to become a pastor. And I could remember it as clear as day when God called me at 15 or 16 years old. And I said, God, no, nah, I ain't going to do it. My friends are saying in high school, bro, there's something about you. I believe you're going to become a pastor. I said, you, you, are you crazy, this party boy? I'm going to parties and with the girls and you're saying, I'm going to be a pastor? You're crazy. You're crazy. They could see something that I could not see. And I'm looking at my damage and saying, God, you will never use me. You could never use a broken, damaged person like me. And some of you have gotten this perception of God because the devil has brought this devastation in your life called damage. And he has damaged you and now he has brought where, where that deception of you being damaged by your mistake is affecting your perception of who God is. You're saying, based upon my damage... God will never be able to use me. Hmm. You have been damaged through life experiences, and life experiences have damaged you so much to the point where you are like, God, no, not me. You will never be able to use me. I would never be able to get married. I would never be able to have a leadership position. God, not me. And God has been calling you to the next level, but you're saying that, God, I'm too broken to be used. You have been damaged by your daddy. You have been damaged by the cover-up. You have been damaged by a mistake. You have been damaged by depression. You have been damaged by pornography. And you're saying that God will never be able to use me because I've been damaged by my ego. But God is saying, no, that's exactly who I am looking for. Somebody who has been damaged. You have been molested, you have been raped, you have been abused, traumatized, divorced, suffered heartbreak, have several abortions, and you're thinking to yourself, God will never use me. But a sermon, what can God do with damage? I want to ponder that today because I'm going to start off in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to go from there, all right? Matthew chapter 1. Reading from verses 1 to 5, the Bible says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We're going to look what God does with damaged people. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashan, and Nashan begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by who? Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And if you keep on reading, you will see that it's through this broken lineage the Messiah came. Jesus Christ came. So hear this. Here's my first point. Point number one. What can God do with damage? Number one, he claims it. Oh God. I said what? He claims it. Notice in all my passage today that Jesus, as he is outlining his lineage, his genealogy, he did not leave out the broken people in his family. He included a name by the name of Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. She was a prostitute. But Jesus still included her as part of his family and did not abandon her, but he still claimed her. As damaged as Rahab was, Jesus still claimed her. Hallelujah. And I'm speaking to somebody today who feel like you have been so damaged, so broken, that Jesus cannot claim you, that Jesus has pushed you aside. Jesus is saying to you today, even if you have Rahab's story, I still claim you as my child. No wonder John says that what manner of love is this? 
that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. John is saying, when I look at the love of God, Christ claims us in spite of us. He looks at this and said that, man, how can Jesus claim broken people like me? He said, this is love. This is the love of God that in spite of it all, he claims us. I remember when in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve messed up, God had to put a plan in place because he wanted to let Adam and Eve know and the entire race that he claims broken people. So Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit got together in a meeting and said, man, who is, what's going to happen with Adam and Eve? What's going to happen to the human race? The first person, Jesus Christ, raised his hand and said, Father, I will go down and I will claim them again. I will go down and I will born as a baby, raised up as a human being, and I will die the most cruel death that a human being could face. And Jesus Christ came down for you. I said, I will come down and die the cruel death because I want to claim you again. I, I remember this story of this, um, this young kid who built this boat and he went to the river and he was in the river. He normally plays with his boat as he's playing with his boat that he built, that he created. One day the storm came while he was out. It was windy and blew away his boat and he could not find it. Well, years passed. He saw the boat in a pawn shop. In the pawn shop, he went to the person who was at the cash register. He said, man, that's my boat. That, that, that's my boat. I built that boat. I know it. It's my boat. He said, no, it, it's, it's mine. You have to pay for it. He says, how much for it? He gave him a number. It was an expensive number. That young kid that he was saving up money for the year, he went to his piggy bank, and he came back to the pawn shop and said, man, I want to buy that boat. He emptied out whatever he was saving just to get back his boat. And he said, man, look, he looked at his boat and said, you are twice bought. I bought you by buying stuff to create you, and then also you made me go and sacrifice my piggy bank to come and get you again. And oh, child of God, I'm telling you not about a boat, but I'm talking about you. Jesus Christ has twice bought you. At first he created you. Second of all he says I'm going to come down and I will die a cruel death for you because you are twice mine. Jesus says that no matter what the enemy tries to do I will still come for you because you are mine. That's the love of Jesus Christ. The love that claims you in spite of you. Rahab should not have been claimed. She was not an Israelite. She was a part of the family of Jericho. Living in Jericho, but yet still Jesus says, man, listen, I'm going to claim you as part of my family. But not only that, what can God do with damage? Number one, he claims it, but number two, he calls it. Shout it out. He calls it. He calls it. Now notice in in the Bible, we see that Jesus Christ, after Matthew chapter 1, we see that Jesus is on the sea now. As, after his lineage was described, Matthew writes and shows that Jesus is now calling what we call disciples. Everybody shout disciples. Disciples. Jesus is calling disciples, and Jesus started to call some people who were highly uneducated. In Jewish culture, Jewish culture, you had to know the Torah by heart, if you wanted to become a disciple. You had to memorize the Torah, the parts of the Old Testament that Moses wrote. You had to memorize that by heart if you wanted to be accepted by a rabbi. And so in that culture, people were looking to be called. To be called as a disciple was a high privilege. That means that you are well educated. But for the disciples, the Bible says in, in, the, in the New Testament that when they looked at the disciples, they said, these are unlearned men. They are preaching the gospel, but they are unlearned men. Because when they are going to school, if they would miss out on memorizing a certain passage, they would kick them out of school. And whenever they are kicked out of school, they would go now to take up the trade of their father. Whatever the trade was, they would take it up. That's the reason why many of these people that Jesus called, they were fishermen. Because that was the natural 
career of the fathers. They would say, man, let me go to fishing. I did not make it in, my, in schooling. I didn't memorize the Torah. So I messed up on my exam. So I'm going to go to fishing. And so Peter and many others followed their father by going to fishing. Because they were cast out as people who were unlearned men. And then you had the tax collectors. The tax collectors were classified as people who were sinners. They, they robbed people. They, they were money hungry. They robbed people. So Jesus Christ, whoop, when he came on the scene, he saw unlearned men, tax collectors, and sinners. And then you had the church folks. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, you got to understand this because the genealogy of Jesus Christ is letting us know something that is powerful. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew is writing on purpose. In the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 7 to chapter 9, you'll see this new language that is described called, these are the generations of Noah. You remember that? These are the generations of Noah. Generations in the Old Testament, the word there means Genesis. It means, in translation, new beginning. Now, Matthew is doing a play on word from the Old Testament, and whenever you see that these are the generations, or these are the genealogy, or this is the genealogy, this means this is a new beginning. Oh God, you missed it. When Jesus came on the scene, what he was sending to the church was for them to know that when Christ came, this was a new beginning. And the Pharisees could not understand it because they were looking at Jesus and seeing him calling tax collectors, calling sinners, calling unlearned men. And Jesus was saying, this is a new beginning. Before I had to use a person from the priesthood of the Levites, but now I'm going to call broken people. Now I'm going to call messed up people. Now I'm going to call damaged people. Now I'm going to call sinners to come to use the, to preach the gospel. And Jesus is saying to you, today that in spite of your brokenness this is a new beginning for you you have been damaged but you have not been destroyed <laughs> Jesus says this is a new beginning I'm using now male and female uh, born on free and Jews and Gentiles uh, this is a new beginning so Jesus Jesus says I can use damaged people I can, I still claim them. I still call them. But number three, watch this. He commissions damaged people. What can God do with damage? He claims it. He calls it. But number three, he commissions it. Hallelujah. After Jesus called these disciples, the 12 of them, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, the Bible says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power whoop, over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Did, did you see that? Who did he give this power and authority to? Come on, shout it out. Sinners, the, the, the tax collectors, the 12 disciples, huh? Could you just shout out any one of the 12 disciples who were perfect? Just shout it out loud. The church is silent. Because none of them were perfect, Anora. They were all broken people. All messed up people. All damaged people. But Christ commissioned them. Now, I want you to look at this text because Christ didn't just commission 11 people. Christ commissioned all the 12 of the disciples, including Judas. Which means that even Judas had the power to resurrect the dead. Even Judas had the power to cast out demons. Even Judas was over there being used by God. In spite of his corrupt, wicked ways. Oh, God Almighty. <laughs> Christ can commission you in spite of your damage or your brokenness. No matter what you have been through, no matter your decisions that you have made, even if you slept with 50 people this year, God can still use you. So 
Some of you have a height of evil that you can do, then God stops using you. God leaves you. But God is letting us know. That sounds nice. But God is letting us know that no matter how messed up you have been, I will still commission you on purpose. <laughs> okay, you don't believe me. Paul says, man, even some people, they might be preaching and they are not of God. They're preaching and they're preaching, but they well know they aren't saved. They well know that they aren't for the Lord. Paul says, leave them alone as long as they preach Jesus. God will still use them for his benefit and glory. And somebody is here today saying, I'm too messed up. I'm too broken to be used. But God is saying, no, 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 no. Even as broken as you are, I will still commission you to preach the word, to sing the word, to testify the word. God can still commission you. This is what God, this is who God is. He looks beyond our faults. He sees our needs and still uses us. Still uses us and commissions us. If you feel like your damage is just too big for God, let me run down a list of people in the Bible that God commissioned. <laughs> Look at this. Abraham was a liar. Elijah was suicidal. Joseph was abused. Job went, went bankrupt. Moses had a speech problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. The Samaritan woman was divorced several times. Noah got drunk. Jeremiah was young. Jacob was a cheater. David was a murderer. Jonah ran from God. Na Naomi was a widow. Peter denied Christ three times. Martha worried about everything. Zacchaeus was small and money hungry. The disciples betrayed Jesus. Paul, a Pharisee who persecuted Christians. And German was a addicted to pornography and yet still God still use all of us in spite of oh boy almighty I don't think they got it faster God still used Jeremiah God still used Jermaine God still used Moses God still commissioned Samson God still commissioned Noah God still commissioned us in spite of us. And I just want just some people to just know that in spite of what you have been through, God can still use you. God can still give you purpose because God still values you. Anybody knows that God can still commission you? God can still use you in spite of your brokenness? Just give God a hand clap of praise and give him the glory. If you know that God can still use you in spite of you, God can still call you. In spite of you, but, but, but not only does he, what can God do with damage? He claims it, he calls it, he commissions it. But number four, he consecrates it. Wow. He, he consecrates it. <laughs> this word consecration is just another word for set apart. To set apart, to make holy, to make perfect, to, to set on purpose. This same word, consecrated. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 illustrates it best. Peter says, but you are a chosen generation. Th this is a damaged person speaking. Peter, who betrayed Jesus. Now, Christ has consecrated him. Hallelujah. Woo! And Peter now started to speak to some broken people. He says, but you are a chosen generation. A royal generation priesthood, a holy nation consecrated, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm going to slow down. I'm preaching too much. The, the reason why some of you think that grace right here is not cheap is because you think that you have to pay for it. You think that you have to pay for your consecration. When God says that you are a holy nation, that I consecrated you, I set you apart. When you look at your damage, he said that cannot be true. I'm not consecrated. You think that you have not been perfected. But I'm about to teach now. Are you ready for this? 
That was the preaching part. Now I go to the teaching part. Okay? Look at this, because I got to break this thing down as we're going to go into the next chapter next year. Okay? Because some of you have this idea of consecration, thinking that consecration means perfection. Okay? You think that now Christ has called you into consecration, that your fixation should now be on perfection. And because sometimes the enemy gets, your, gets to your nerves, and when he gets to your nerves and you mess up, you move now feeling like you are experiencing consecration to condemnation. And you think now that God has turned his back on you. No more are you consecrated because you have been damaged. You messed up. But I want to show you something. Let me teach it right here because this is, this is necessary for teaching because I want to unpack God's grace right here in this moment. Because the cheap grace theology says grace is not cheap because it requires your willpower to be saved. But grace alone, theology says, grace is grace, and you don't have to do anything on your part. Grace alone, theology, says you can only receive grace, but you can earn grace. Grace alone, theology says, grace is cheap because somebody paid for it. <laughs> Woo! Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 to 9 highlights the grace alone theology and why we should embrace it because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of what? Works, lest anyone should boast. Write this point down. Number one, God's grace is God's gift. Yes. When you're, when you're talking about being consecrated, when it talks about God consecrating you, you have to understand this, that God's grace is God's gift. Grace is a gift. You can earn or achieve it is something that you receive. Just like your Christmas present. Somebody bought you a Christmas gift this year. Somebody said no. Somebody needs to buy him a Christmas gift before he leaves here. <laughs> Let him feel special today. Okay? <laughs> if somebody buys you a Christmas gift in this season, do they expect... I sounded like I'm in some tunnel. I'm in a tunnel. Do that again. Do that again. I'm joking. I'm joking. But if somebody buys you a Christmas gift, that person is not expecting you to pay them for it. They aren't expecting you to go and bring a donation to them. I said, man, I'm really appreciative of that gift you gave me. They aren't expecting you to do that, okay? Because grace is God's gift to you. Now, it is a freely given gift to you. And you've got to understand this because you cannot work for grace. You cannot work for salvation. And when you come to Christ... This is his free gift that he gives to you. John says that when you come to Christ, to those who received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons and daughters of God. Which means that the moment you come to Christ, he gives you consecration. The moment you come to Christ, he gives you perfection. I, I felt that in my spirit. The moment you come to Christ and you receive him, Paul says in Corinthians that Jesus Christ is our sanctification, our righteousness, and our redemption. Paul is letting us know that in consecration, grace is given to you. It's a gift to you. You cannot work for it. As soon as you receive Christ, you get the whole package. And then John, uh, Paul says in verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 2, this is the reason why you get this gift, and you cannot work for it, lest anyone should boast. If you start to work for salvation, Paul is letting us know, 
then we walk around with pride. Oh, yeah. I didn't eat pork. Check. I didn't commit adultery. Check. I didn't lie. Check. I'm doing good. What? I went to church this week. Check. I fed the hungry. Check. And you are walking around thinking, man, I'm the baddest thing around here. Devil, you don't get nothing on me. You don't have nothing on me, devil. Come on. Throw your best shot. You throw it? That's your best shot? Man, come on. And you're walking around thinking that I'm per this is all my doing. This is called willpower. Willpower. And you come up in here looking around like, oh, why is her skirt so long? I mean, short. Why is, why is her skirt so short? And you start to be upset with people now and walking around telling, go, no, 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 next week, make sure you wear a long skirt. And you start to be church police because you worked your way to your own perfection. And Christ has rejected all self-work. Everything that is dealing with the self, if you are the one who overcame that, Christ rejected that. Because salvation cannot be worked for. It cannot be something that is a checklist. It's something that you receive. And so God's grace is a gift. But number two, God's grace generates growth. Do you hear me? God's grace generates growth. So, so God gifts us with salvation. He gifts us with consecration. But then when he gifts us grace, it's not for us to go and look for sin. Did, did you hear me? It's not us to go around and say, devil, send all the sin you got. Okay? So, so God's grace generates growth, meaning that when you come to Christ, he is going to give you so much grace that you are just going to look at the grace of a God and say, God, because of your grace to me, I want to be faithful. Because of your grace to me, I want to do what is right. Because of your grace for me, God, I want to live holy. When God gifts you with grace, it's a motivation for you to want to love him back. So grace, God's grace generates growth. But in God's grace, when it generates growth, hear what? I don't want you to rush the process. Because when you hear the word growth, you might be thinking immediate victory. This is what has been taught in several churches for a long time. That as long as you go through these six weeks of Bible studies, you will be perfect. You will generate, generate growth. You will have victory over your addiction to smoking, your addiction to marijuana, your addiction to pornography, your addiction to sexual behaviors. They say that the moment you come to Christ, six weeks we're going to give you. And after these six weeks, then we are going to baptize you, and you will be perfect. You'll be perfect, okay? But don't forget this point. God's grace generates growth. Meaning that growth sometimes doesn't happen immediately, but growth happens gradually. Are you hearing me? Growth most times doesn't happen immediately. It happens gradually. Talking about consecration. Deacon Faria, could you come here real quick, please? I want you to stand right here. I want you to say, you, you want to come, Grace? Come on, Grace, come. Come. Grace is raving her hand. Come on, Pastor. Call me. Call me. All right. So Deacon Farrell right here. And um, Grace, I want you to stand right here. I've got to illustrate this. Thank you very much. All right. Because when you come to Christ right here, this is, this is what we call the gift. You are a gift. God gifts us with growth. God gifts us with grace. Okay. Now, grace is where victory is. Everybody say victory. This is where victory is. So when you come to Christ with your addictions and with your problems, as soon as you come to Christ, this is where you start. You start from gift. Everybody say gift. Gift. Christ gives you a gift, and that gift is grace, salvation. He says you are saved. This is you right here. But being saved doesn't mean that you will be freed from every addictions you have immediately. It's going to happen 
gradually. You got me. It's going to happen gradually. So on this journey of growth that is happen happening gradually, it's going to look like this. Okay? But some of you are looking right now and getting tired. Like this, this is tiring. Is it really going to take his time all the way down there? <laughs> and you're looking right now and you're upset that it's taking too long for me to go down to victory. But Christ is just smiling. Like, I got this. Because what Christ does, he says, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Meaning that salvation, it starts at justification, at the gift, but Christ has us on a journey of growth, which is sanctification. On this journey of sanctification, Christ said it's going to be a lifetime. Somebody don't like the pastor, D.D. It's going to happen in a lifetime. And so Christ says, I'm patient. I'm the God who will take my time to work that thing out of you. The church might be upset with your addiction down there. The church might be upset that you still drink. The church is upset that you're still addicted to certain things. But guess what? I am the patient God. I'm the God who can handle your addictions. I'm the God who can handle your brokenness and your damage. So he's taking his time doing his own perfect work of pruning. Now, on this journey, what some people will do, Deacon Farrier, is because I'm taking so long to go down there to grace, to, vict to victory, they will come. Come, Elder Walker. Come here, Elder Walker. They will come to you, like when you come in the church. And Elder Walker will try to push me. Come on, Elder Walker. Push me as hard as you can. For me to run down to victory. And what was just happened right there is that I was pushed by a church member to expedite my growth. And because my growth was expedited, I came down here thinking that I'm in victory, but I'm really in bondage. So in public, I look fine. I still have on a nice suit. I still wear nice shoes. I still go to Burlington and look nice on the outside. But in private, I'm struggling. In the public, I look whole. But in the private, I'm still bound. And this is when the church rushes a person to come down to victory. And Christ is saying, no, 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 leave me alone, leave me alone. Leave. I am the one, I am Jesus. Let me work on my child. Don't rush them. I'm the God who is patient. Something just came in my mind by the Holy Spirit. This is the reason why when Jesus delivered the people out of Egypt, he delivered them from Egypt and said to them, what, Elder Walker? I'm going to bring you to where? Canaan land, right? The promised land, Canaan land. He said, I'm going to bring you to victory land. And on this journey, it can take how many days it could have taken? Forty? Forty days it could have taken to go to victory. But what did God say? It's going to take 40 years. God said, I can take you there in 40 days. You want to be there in 40 days. The process of immediately growing. But guess what I'm going to do? Because since Egypt, you were in Egypt so long, I can deliver you from Egypt, but it's not going to take 40 days to deliver Egypt out of you. So God says that I am going to make the process take 40 years instead of 40 days because I'm the God who does this and it's okay. I'm the God who is okay with this. Are you getting it? God is saying, don't rush me. When, Mary, when Martha sent the disciples to go to get Jesus because Lazarus was dead, they said, Jesus, come now. Your brother, the, my, the, the, your friend, he's dying right now. He's sick. He's dying. Come now. Now. Jesus says that. This sickness is not unto death. Come on. Just go and tell him that. He waited all the morning, more days, two more days. By the time Jesus went back to go to Martha, guess what? How many days Lazarus was dead? 
four days. Why? Because Jesus is okay with this. Because he's God. <laughs> he is God all by himself. And he's a God who loves you and cares about you. And said, though they might try to rush you, I'm still here with you. This year you are stuck in some addictions. You are stuck on porn. You are stuck doing some wicked things. You are stuck doing some evil things. You still had some evil thoughts. You are still lusting. You are still doing some evil things on the street. You are still going to that club. You are still drinking. You still smoke a couple times. But I'm okay with this because I'm the God in due time. Woo! I will give you the victory in due time. I will give you the victory. So, so Christ says, don't rush this. So, so how do we now, if we're on this journey of growing gradually, and if we want, say for instance, you, for you, you're saying that, man, I'm so addicted right now. It's so bad that it seems like my marriage is about to be destroyed. Or you're thinking that you're about to lose your job because every time you're on your job, you go on social media and you're addicted to social media. And you're saying, how can I overcome this addiction? Because my break time was 30 minutes, but here I am in the bathroom, stuck in there for 45 minutes, and the boss is one worried. Where is this person? Where is Susie? Where is David? He's in the bathroom. She's in the bathroom. Stuck on social media. So, if you have a problem, an addiction problem, that you want to get over, hear what? Hear what? You can get growth to be expedited when you've joined a group. Did you hear me? You can have growth being expedited when you join a group. What do I mean? Paul says, forsake not the assembling of one another together. Paul says, join a group because when you come to church like this group right here, a group that comes together to worship the King of Kings, there's something that takes place when you hear the word of God, when you hear the music, when you see people who are broken, when you know their story and you see that they're not destroyed, they're still smiling, they're still pressing on. That gives you some courage to keep holding on, to keep fighting, to keep holding on because if God did it for them, he can do it for me and I'm still going to pray. Press on. So, so you can have your growth expedited by joining a group. All right? But as you join a group, be careful of what group you join. <laughs> be, be careful of what group you join, Grace. Because some group don't understand grace. And if that group doesn't understand grace, they will only lead you into deeper bondage. So you think that, okay, I joined this group. It's a Bible study group. I'm going to learn about God. When you go into that group, all of a sudden they're telling you, you need to do it. You need to go and put down smoking. You need to go home right now and tell yourself, I'll never do it again. And they're giving you Bible studies that are centered on works. Your own works. So be careful of what group you join. Because some group will try to rush you to victory. But Christ is saying that when you join a healthy group, like a church service that is Christ-centered, that talks about grace, or a Bible study that lifts up Jesus, or a small group, or a prior meeting, when you join healthy groups, it may expedite your growth. You might see some people give you some, edu some pointer so that, you know what, you can, uh, you can try this, you can try therapy, you can try counseling because that's what I tried. And they helped me to navigate some things that I went through as a child. And, 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 and they helped me to recognize my trauma, those experiences that broke me so bad. And they were able to help me navigate through that. This is what happens when you get into a healthy group. They point you to, right, to the right sources to help you get information, to help you process what you have been experiencing in your damage. But in those groups, watch this. In those groups, I want to let you know that when you are in those groups, you got to know that they will try to rush you. Some groups will try to rush you, while some groups will give you grace. But I want you to let you know that don't go into groups that try to rush you to perfection. Because that is just applying behavior modification. 
when Christ does his perfect work, Ella Walker. So now Ella Walker is representing Christ. This is what Christ is doing. He's holding me as his own son. And he's saying, my son, I will take my time. Walk with me. Take my time. Through the storm, it's, don't worry, son, I'm still here. Through the heartaches, I'm still here. Job was rough this week, daddy. And I was so stressed, daddy. I felt so much pain, daddy. I wanted to give up. I wanted to give up on you. I wanted to give up on the church. I wanted to give up on my family. It was so hard. And my father responds, God the father. He says, son, I'm still here. It's okay to feel like that. But just hold on to faith. Because feelings are in faith. So even though you feel like that, it's okay. I'm the God who can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Ooh! And God said, I'll be patient with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he keeps encouraging me on the journey. I messed up. Oh, my God, I messed up. I messed up. I told that lie on my tax return. And I knew I should not have lied on my tax return. I just wanted to get more money. I told them that I had, I had tr three children when I didn't have three. I only had two. <laughs> and God said, I forgive you. I'll still hold your hand, son, and walk with you. Are you guys going to be real? And walk with you to victory. Hallelujah. He says, I'll take my time. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus Christ, who is a patient God, the loving God, the caring God, the wonder-working God, the kind God who says, I will be patient with you. I'll be patient on your journey of perfection. So Christ, at gift, declares you perfect, and on the growth and growing gradually, he is perfecting you. Declared perfect while perfecting you. I want you to get that in your head. You're declared perfect. You have salvation. But on your journey, Christ is perfecting you. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together for those who participated in the illustrations. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. Huh? Very soon. All right, pray for somebody real quick. She said, can I pray? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for being patient with me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 God is being patient with us. Okay? Lastly, and I'm done. Lastly, lastly, as, as we recognize that uh, Christ, he, he, when he comes on to grace, God's grace is God's gift. Number two, God's grace generates growth. But lastly, God's grace is a manifestation of God's unconditional love for you. Woo! You see, human love is different from God's love. This is the reason why some people could not get the illustration. Because you are thinking on a level of human being. Of a human being. You're thinking that love should look like when you mess up. You rebuke the person. You destroy them. You, you beat them. You, you let them die. You let some evil happen to them. But God is saying, no, 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 no. You're mixing up my love with your love. My love is different. That's the reason why I can be patient with them in their problem. This is the reason why I can be patient with them in their damage. Because my love is different from your love. And some of you think that you, oh, no, 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 no. My love is the same as God. No, 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 no. You will be God. You'll be God. God, nobody can love like Jesus loved. You hear me? Jesus' love is on another level. Because if it was human beings, when Adam and Eve fell, all of us would be like, man, peace out. I ain't going to Calvary. I ain't going to die not knowing if I'm going to be raised again. Peace out. Jesus says that I will go. I will suffer the most cruel death. I will die for them. And I will go down to Hades, to the grave. And guess what I will do? Not knowing if I will really get up for real, for real. I've never died before. Christ, I've never died before. I'm going there. I know I have the word of my father. That in three days I will rise again. But I've never died before. <laughs> I don't know nothing when I'm down there, when I'm dead. Huh? He said, I'm not going to know anything, but I'm going to trust the word of the Father. That in three days I will get back up again. 
This is the reason why his love is different from our love. He says that I'll do anything to get them back. This is my love. It is a love that, I ca- that he calls unconditional love. Everybody shout unconditional. Unconditional. Human being loves with a condition. Okay? They love. You, 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 you. <laughs> you do something that gets in a person's nerves, and you will see if they loved you unconditionally. <laughs> Huh? You get in a relationship and then you start to cheat on the person and you start to sleep with all these guys around here and then see if that relationship will still be around. That's what? Loving on condition. Anytime you do this, peace out. Because you set a condition. In your marriage vow, you said until death do us part, but you, you know that's a lie. That person does something that you don't like, if they start to go around and, and, and molest people and rape people and launch bombs and atomic bombs, launching on different children all over the place, start to do drug trafficking, peace out. <laughs> because our love is based upon a condition. But the reason why we can celebrate Christ today is because Christ can still love anyone unconditionally. Christ can still love the drunker. Christ can still love you in your brokenness. Christ can still love you in your bad habits. Christ can still love you in your lying. Christ can still love you in your gossiping. Christ can still love you in your negative feelings. Christ can still love you in your evil thoughts. Christ can still love you in your multiple abortions. Christ can still love you in your prostitution. Christ can still love you in your masturbation. Is anyone glad today while I I close that when people gave up on you, Christ still loves you? Is anyone glad that when you are damaged by daddy, damaged by the cover-up, damaged by mistake, damaged by depression, damaged by ego, damaged by porn, Jesus Christ still loves you. Woo! I'm so glad that in spite of us, Jesus still loves us. Come on, put your hands together and give God a hand clap of praise. That in spite of our damage, in spite of our brokenness, Jesus says, I still love you unconditionally. That's the reason I'm God. That on your journey of being evil, sometimes you have evil thoughts, wicked thoughts, I can love you through it. I can still hold your hands and not let you go. While your mother or father or your friends will still let you go, I will still come by you and hold your hands. Come, child. No, no, no. Get back up again. You fell? How many times? One time? Oh, get back up again. Oh, oh, you fell again this month again? Come on. Get back up again. Come on. We're still on a journey. Come on. Don't stay down. Come on. You fell. Oh, oh, you cheat. You, 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 you lied. Okay. Get back up again. Come on. We can still go to victory. Come on. Oh, 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 you, you, you cheated on your spouse. Come on. Come on. Get back up again. Come, come. Come on. Let's walk. Keep on. Keep on. Keep on walking. Oh, 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 oh. you're addicted to porn. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You fell. Oh, that's what? The fourth time or the fifth time? Come on. Come on. Yeah. Get, get, get back up again. Some of you are tired of me doing this because the Bible, uh, the Bible says the righteous what? Is perfect all the time? No, 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 no. A righteous man falls seven times. One time. Two times. Three times. Four times. Five times. Five, six times. Seven times. But he gets back up again. That's what Jesus does. He's not looking for you to focus on perfection, but progression. Woo! Jesus is saying, child, I'm the patient God. Come on. Come on. I'm here for you. Come on. You're just thankful. You're just thankful. You're just thankful and say, God, thank you. For being patient with me. Come on, on this season of celebration, say, God, thank you for being patient with me in my damage. So what can God do with damage? He claims it. He calls it. He commissions it. And he consecrates it. And if you're saying, God, (laughs) use me in my damage, stand to your feet. God, use me in my damage. God, Claim me, call me, commission me, 
consecrate me. Hallelujah. This series has blessed my soul. I hope it did bless yours. We have been through a lot of experiences. But yet still Jesus says that I won't leave you. I won't leave you. Many of the sermons I preach, there are things that I've, been, I've gone through in high school. Things that I've been through. Oakwood. Struggles that I had. That God freed me from. Talking about being damaged. At four years old, somebody tried to molest me. At four years old, that messed up my whole brain. But yet still God said, I'll still call you, son. At 12 years old, saw a magazine with pornography on it. And I just got hooked to this thing. And for years, struggled with that thing so bad. And Christ said, son, I will be patient with you until I freed you. Thank God for my wife that when she, I told her about it, she still embraced me and says, I will work with you. I still love you. Until Jesus broke that thing out of my life. What I talk to you about is something that Christ brought me through. Being damaged but not destroyed. And God is saying to some people today, you have been damaged. You have been abused. You have been molested. You have been through trauma. You have been through experiences that have damaged your whole framework. But I can give you a new mind. Your heart has been broken. I've been damaged so much by relationships to the point where I gave up and I said, God, man, forget it. I will not date again until you send one. Uh, you, have, you have to send the person to me because I'm not dating again. I have been there. I have been damaged. I have been there. And God is saying to you, what can I do with damage? <laughs> Come to me and I'll show you. <laughs> Give me your heart and I'll show you. Start right here. Don't, 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 don't even focus on the journey. Just start right here at the place of gift. Let me gift you with grace. Start right here. And I will be patient with you on the journey. This is you. You're saying that, God, I want to start for this upcoming year, for the new year, for what you're about to do in my life. I want to start here because I realized I, I moved from here and I went all the way down here and I'm still broken. I'm still addicted. I suppressed that thing so much. That I'm still broken by it, but I don't want to tell anybody about it. So God, come on. We're starting over. We're starting from right here. Let's walk again. You do it this time. Not me. You do it this time. And you're saying, God, in my damage, I'm coming to you clean. I'm not going to put up a facade anymore. I'm coming back right here. Say, God, work on me. Use me. I'm giving you my brokenness my, my, and, my, and my damage. I'm not going to cover up and think that it's all perfect. It's all good with me. No, 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 no. I'm damaged. I've been traumatized. I've been abused. The amount of people who told me that they have been abused, they have been gone through molestation and rape and, 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 and done things and been addicted to different things, but yet still God has been holding them. And God, I want to let you know as your pastor, there is no judgment here. There, there is no judgment. You're talking to a pastor who has been through it all. Who have been damaged. But God called me anyhow. I want to use you. And it took so long, years, for some things to be broken. God is saying, don't worry. You're in the space where this message will be preached. And God is a patient God who loves you. He'll take his time. Today, I'm gonna to say, Jesus, I want to start over. Raise your hand. If you're saying, God, I want to start there. No more rushing to there. I want to start right there, God. Just raise your hand. Just raise it high. As we close out this series, come up from. Come, come, come. All those who raise your hand. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. We're saying, God, I'm starting right here at gift, the gift of grace. And Lord, you take your time with me. I'm not gonna rush the process. 
I might still eat some things that I know they're unhealthy, but I'm not going to rush the process. You break that thing out of my life. Okay, you work on me, God. Your own timing. Your own timing, God. Your own timing. Hallelujah. There's somebody else. You're saying that, God, I want to give my life to you. I want to again. I want to be baptized. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to start here and make it public to say that this is where I'm at. I'm starting over with Jesus. I'm giving my life afresh. I'm going into the new year clean, spooky clean. I want to give my life to Christ in baptism. Come on, just raise a hand real high. Just wave it. You don't even have to wave it too long. Just wave it. You want to be rebaptized? Hallelujah. Jeff is saying, I'm going into the new year spooky clean. Hallelujah. You're saying, I'm going into the new year spooky clean. I'm starting here with Jesus. I'm damaged, but I am not destroyed. Jeff, hallelujah. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Grace is saying to me, just wave your hand, Grace. Grace is saying, I want to be baptized. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Let's say next. I'm, this is my beginning of new beginnings. I'm starting here. Where are you at? Just wait. Ah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah. She's saying that, yes, Lord. I remember when I gave my life to Christ, Christ, that young age. I thought that, man, this was going to be the hardest thing in my life. But until all the time Christ told me, son, I am the one doing the work. Trust me. Okay, I'm the one doing the work. I love you. And man, it's the best decision I've ever made. Leaving those parties, saying goodbye to some of those friends. I say, Jesus, I, I want to start here. I want to start here now with you. Somebody else. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to be baptized. You want to say, Jesus, I want to start the year anew, afresh, brand new, spooky clean in baptism. My first time, my second. God, I want to give my life to you. Where are you at? Just wave it. Just wave it real quick. You want to say here again, Jesus? Hallelujah. 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 I believe somebody is here. I believe somebody. God is saying somebody is speaking to right now. He's speaking to somebody. Where are you? You, you, you hear his voice. You know his voice. He's speaking to you. Just, just, just lift it up high. Even if you're shy, you say, this is me. I want to give my life to Christ. I see you. I see you. I see you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is me. Come on. Put your hands together. Come on. Celebrate. Let's celebrate. The Bible says that there's joy in heaven when one says yes to Jesus. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Just, just wave your hand. You don't even have to raise it high if you don't feel comfortable. Just shake your hand. And I'll see it. Hallelujah. 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 Our family is saying, yes, Jesus. I want to be baptized. Could you get their number, Valencia? Could you get all of their numbers for me? You want to call them and celebrate with them. You're here. Just, just wave your hand. Come on. Where are you at? You're here. You're online. You're here. Just wave your hand. Grace is saying, do it, Pastor. Do it even now, Pastor. Hallelujah. You want to start afresh. Hallelujah. 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 Just wave your hand. I'm about to pray. Don't let this moment pass you by. I'm about to pray. I'm going to pray for you. Hallelujah. Let us. Let us pray. Let us pray as Valencia is going around. Just fill out those cards. She will give you a call and we'll talk and set you up for a baptism. Baptism date. By the grace of God, we'll have one next week. And um, yes, we'll have one next week and we'll just start the year, year end of the year, starting the new year, brand new. Are, are, are you ready? Brand new. Uh, fresh. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and we have communion next week too, so it's going to be a full high day of just glorifying God. Let us pray together. Father, thank you so much. For those who are saying, I want to start here. I want to start at the place of gift. Then you take your time to bring me down to victory. So Lord, I pray today that you will surround us with your glory, with your power, your majesty, and help us to be patient with ourselves as well. Because sometimes we beat up ourselves with guilt. I will never make it. 
I will never make it down to victory. I will never become the child that God wants me to be. Help us, God, to trust the process. And Lord, I pray for those who raise their hands for baptism. Pray that you'll seal the deal. I pray that, Lord God, they will be encouraged. I'm so happy for them right now because, Lord, you're going to use them. Some people, you may write a book, you used to write a book, and they never knew it. Some people have been broken, and you are going to use them for the new year to do something amazing. Bless them. Seal the decision. And let them, oh God, be able to make it public and share it all over. That Jesus Christ, in my damage, has helped me to know that I'm loved and I'm valued in spite of all that I've gone through. In Jesus' name, let everybody say, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All those who raise their hands or want to be baptized, just stay at the front right here. Just stay at the front row. And we will just, I'll come down and pray with you and celebrate with you. Hallelujah.